This is Undaunted Life, a man's podcast. I'm your host, Kyle Thompson. Let's get into it. All right, guys, we've got a special guest on the podcast today. His name is David McCloskey. So he is a former CIA analyst, and while at the CIA, he worked in field stations across the Middle East, and he even briefed senior White House officials and Arab royalty. But then he transitioned at one point to become a novelist, which is what he does now. So he's the author of two novels, and he has a third one coming out later this year. But his novels are Damascus Station and his new book that I have right here called Moscow X. And so the the fun thing about this conversation is it reminded me a lot of the conversations I've had with Greg Hurwitz, who was on a few weeks ago and it's because of Greg Hurwitz that David and I even know each other because uh, Greg was doing a book tour last year so this would have been 2023 and one of the stops was in Dallas I went down there to hang out with Greg Hurwitz but then you know a group of us went out to dinner afterwards and David was one of the guys that was at dinner and so he and I kind of struck up a a nice conversation about him and his family and the stuff that he used to do and that he's a writer and he's like yeah whenever I have a a new book coming out uh, my second novel's coming out we should talk about it and so that's what this conversation is today and so we talk about his background, uh, his education, kind of what led him to the CIA, some common misreceptions about what it looks like to actually work for the CIA. But I did ask him about, you know, black ops, things that that happened, uh, that happened clandestinely that maybe we aren't aware of, like how much of that is true. We talked about kind of the deep state, whether or not the CIA is actually spying on Americans. I asked him a question about what's going on at the southern border and whether or not we as a federal government or as you know federal law enforcement agencies, if we have any idea what's coming over uh, the border and kind of what their intentions are. But then we talk about his transition into being a novelist, like what happens whenever he kind of like had to burn the ships and say, no, I need to treat this job of writing as my full-time gig if I'm going to be successful doing this and the amount of research that goes in the amount of editing we talk about some misperceptions about the whole publishing world and then we talk about Moscow X and kind of where the interest came from Russia but he was just very open and honest about some of his failings as a writer some of the things that he did where it's like no we got to scrap this entire thing and start over but then also just his entire approach to the whole thing but we we weaved in and out of a bunch of different topics I really really enjoyed my time with him so I'm not going to keep him from you any longer so without further ado let's get into it David McCloskey, welcome to Undaunted Life of Man's podcast. Hey, thanks, Kyle. Great to be here. Now, the last time you and I were together, we were having a delicious meal in the Dallas area. We were both there because Greg Hurwitz is a mutual buddy of ours. And so we were at a table. We were kind of chit-chatting. Now, do you remember the main takeaway I gave you from our conversation? I said, hey, David, you need to start doing this one thing. Do you remember what that one thing was? I do. I I do remember. And I I will tell you uh, that when I woke up this morning, I knew not only was this going to be the first question, but that my answer was going to be deeply disappointing to you. Well, how about you Um, give everyone the background? I've I've prepared prepared for it. Okay. All right. So we, uh, Greg Hurwitz, uh, you know, exceptional writer, slightly above average human being came through Dallas, Texas, Mm -hmm. uh, for his book tour last year, you and I had not met. We're sitting at a table at dinner talking. And at some point it comes up that I am considering taking my then seven year old to jujitsu. Yeah. Okay. Um, or actually, you know what? I actually think the conversation started broader than that. It was just kind of like we were, I I don't know if we were talking about just kind of self-defense or what, but we got to, you were like, you know, a, a real sort of evangelist for taking him to jujitsu lessons. Yeah. And, uh, and I left that dinner pretty fired up about it. And it, it, it literally did not happen. There's a better, there's a good news story with my son and his um, athleticism and getting involved using his body this year. Okay. But it's not, it's not jujitsu. So I, when I literally, when I woke up this morning thinking about this talk that we were going to have, I was like, man, Kyle's going to be, he's going to look like he does right now. He's going to be well, shaking his head. Well, this could be the shortest interview in the history of Undaunted Life and Man's podcast. Cause I am <laughs> we're, furious. We're done. I we're am done. <laughs> furious from the beginning, but I will just say, since I am an evangelist for all the benefits of, jujitsu not just with self-defense but bodily you know mentally all those different things that is an open invitation to you to anytime you want to but not just for your son but also for you because you know we were sitting there we're looking around the restaurant it's like hey man how many of these people you think know how to fight and the answer is like 
If they don't train, the answer is right. freaking none of them. None of these losers know how to fight. And so that's the thing. We will move past that. I will move beyond my disappointment. I will be the bigger man, obviously, David. And you know, the next I appreciate that. I do need that. I need you to be the bigger man here in this case. But so where you, you live, you've got a lot of good schools there. It's going to be good for you. I will keep bringing that up. But we need to get into what we're going to be talking about today. But before we get into uh, the new book, we kind of have to set up your background because that really leads into what we're going to be talking about. So you worked for the CIA. Now, here's the thing. When somebody works for the CIA, two things automatically come up. People are like, oh, that job sounds really, really awesome, or oh, that job sounds really, really boring. It just depends on what your background is. <laughs> but what I want to know is what in your background, David, or what in your education led you to the CIA? Because I don't remember the CIA being at the job fair in my high school. <laughs> well, uh, you know what? It was actually, it wasn't a full-on job fair, but a uh, the guy who ran what was then the Middle East, like kind of analytic division at CIA showed up on my college campus when I was 19. He was an alum and he was coming through the Chicagoland area uh, to do recruiting at some much bigger schools. But he came by campus because, you know, he'd gone he'd gone to my little school. It's called Wheaton College mm -hmm. outside of uh, Chicago. And, uh, you know, it was one of those things where at the time, right, I'm, I'm 19 I had literally just finished like my previous, uh, you know, employment experience was I had been digging holes for a sprinkler system company the prior summer. Sounds and fancy. I'm like, I, I'm I'm at the same time, and I'm I'm studying international relations. My mom's horrified by this because you know she's like, you're never gonna get a job, you know. So so I'm thinking at this time, like because of the hole digging on the resume, I probably won't get in, but you know, I'll apply and kind of see what happens. So it was this very organic, like I hadn't planned on this. I hadn't put myself in this situation, but this guy came, spoke to our class. They took resumes. I put mine in and I ended up, I ended up getting, you know, an offer to become uh, an undergraduate intern at the Central Intelligence Agency. So that's how, that's how I got in. Okay. So you became an intern, but then you eventually became uh, an analyst, correct? That's right. Okay. Yeah. Which, yeah. So I was I was an analyst, which yeah. basically tells me nothing. So what in the world does a CIA analyst actually <laughs> do? Uh, all right. So so here's I think the best way to to think about it because right? so so much of what so much of the, the like the lens for the CIA as you're suggesting right up front is like Hollywood crazy stuff right. or you know leaks to a newspaper, conspiracy theories, most of which are not true, but some of some are, um, you know, so it, it, everyone ends up with this pretty like distorted view of like the actual day to day work of the agency, right? Hmm. The best way I could describe the job to you is it was like clandestine journalism. Okay. Okay. So it's like, I am a imagine me as a reporter. And I've got a whole bunch of different sources, I've got a question I'm trying to answer, right? For and I'm writing an article for somebody who needs to make a decision, right? I'm not making a decision about foreign or defense policy, but I'm writing something for the president who ostensibly will. And there's a, an important topic. You know, I worked on Syria. So let's say like we're, we're writing about what's going to happen in the Syrian civil war, right? Broad question, but really important. I'm using a whole bunch of different sources. To answer that question, I'm using human sources, some of whom have, you know, literally provided us with stolen secrets from the Syrian government. I'm using satellite imagery. I'm using signals intercepts, um, you know, phone calls, text messages, emails, faxes, whatever. Um, I'm using anything available in the open source. I'm using reporting from our embassy. And I'm, I'm writing the answer to that question. And I'm backing that up with verifiable facts to explain why I'm saying what I'm saying. And so it's very it's very similar to the way a journalist would write a story and then put it out in a paper. You're thinking about, you know, how do I how do I know what I know? How do I articulate the argument that I'm trying to articulate? And how do you do it in a really clear, ideally, you know, apolitical, non value laden, fact based way? So someone gets the best possible information. That was the job. OK, so. Um... Just even in your answer there, David, you were able to dispel some of the common misperceptions about the job within the CIA. But obviously, you've you've had a discussion with a lot of people before about the fact that you did work with the CIA. It's obviously not a secret. But what are some yeah. of the most common 
misperceptions that you hear about people that just work at the CIA in general and any one of the different you know branches or divisions? Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, there would be a whole bunch of misconceptions that I might group underneath this category of superhero spies, right? Mm. So there would be ideas that there's a lot of car chases, that there's a lot of action, that there's a lot of shooting, that most of what a CIA officer and typically in the sort of superhero land, they would call them agents, which is totally incorrect. The agent is the foreigner who's providing the information. The CIA officer is the one, who, you know, typically the American who works for the CIA, who's collecting the information. Hmm. Um, you know, there'd be this view that, yeah, there's there's a lot of, that it, that it feels, the day-to-day -day feels a lot more kind of like an action movie. I mean, I think everyone would sort of understand that movies are movies, so that's not really how it is. But because that's the lens, um, you, you'd have this sense of, oh, the CIA is operating and doing this kind of work inside the United States of America, right? That'd right. be another one. Not true. Um, so that would be a big category uh, as well. I think, you know, related to that one would be this idea that the CIA is like super efficient <laughs> and that it's not a massive, you know, that like, you know, it, it's, there, there's a lot of high tech stuff and that the, the headquarters is slick and communications, you know, are pretty simple and the tech always works. And the CIA is really kind of omniscient in this telling when, you know, the flip side of the agency, which does do a lot of really interesting, very cool work and really exceptional work, you know, is that it's a massive government bureaucracy. And so you think about any big bureaucracy, like they, they sort of, they have similar dysfunction, right? So the agency, that'd be another kind of, I think, theme uh, of, of misperception about the agency is that it doesn't really behave like a big bloated organization when in fact, like anyone, anyone listening to this who works at a big, you know, inside a big organization or, or who has worked with a big organization would be able to immediately understand some of the problems with, you know, too many layers of people, confusion around roles, lots of meetings and emails, people sitting in front of desks, like all that's happening too. What's funny about that is every time I see a depiction of like the CIA or the FBI on a television show or in a movie, and they have like super modern open floor plan offices and all these like really sexy yeah. looking things. It's like, guys, this, this isn't happening like in Silicon Valley. Like this is, this is in Langley or this is somewhere like that. Like these are, have you ever been to an old government building? It probably looks a lot like that, but you, you mentioned something kind yeah. of er earlier about how, you know, a lot of these things we think are happening here on our soil aren't. But, you know, a lot has been made about the quote unquote deep state. Now that is kind of used in, right. a, in political parlance about the deep state being, you know, against Trump or against this person or creating all of these, you know, uh, false flag operations. But then obviously we see agencies like the CIA saying, yeah, we're not spying on Americans only to find out later. It's like, oh, yeah, of course they are. Like they're spying literally on just about everybody at all times. So give me your perspective on that, because obviously you got to see it from the inside and some of us are just taking, you know, our cues from our favorite, you know, conservative podcaster or something like that. But it does seem like there are there are certainly operations going on in America involving American citizens that that don't seem to be on the up and up in terms of what we hear at a press conference, if it's fair to say it that way. Mm. Well, I think um, I think getting down a couple levels deeper into what's really happening would probably be helpful because yeah. the CIA um, there's, there's a series of executive orders. So uh, you rewind the CIA is created in 1947, right? It is essentially sort of the president's black bag outfit for mm. the first few decades of its, of its existence. It is not a well bureaucratized, institutionalized thing. There really isn't a lot of congressional oversight. Um, there isn't a great sense of its actual budget, right? Which which is still sort of a problem, but is yeah. much more of a problem in the yeah. 50s and 60s. It's a new organization fighting the Cold War um, and, tr and and trying to figure out the, the rules of the road. And in many respects, I think doing a very poor job, right? So th that, that, age, that world of that agency, I think, colors a lot of the way we think about it today, even, right? Because a lot of the kind of more conspiratorial stuff comes out of that period and in fact was, was true, right? So I just offer that as some general context. I think mm. you zoom 
forward, the CIA is being, and in particular, its relationship with American citizens is being governed by a series of executive orders that that prohibit the CIA. Um, and these go back to like the 70s and 80s, early 80s. These, um, the most common, uh, the, the sort of the, the most important one is, is uh, Executive Order 12333, which prohibits the CIA from spying on uh, Americans and from, uh, from using Americans in intelligence operations unwittingly, right? So the agency maintains um, bases and stations across the United States under its what's called NR division, National Resources Division. So the agency has a presence throughout the United States, um, you know, outside of Langley. Now, what those bases and stations are focused on doing, for the most part, is actually um, foreign intelligence collection on non-American, you know, on foreigners who are here in the United States who might have some kind of value in terms of, of you know, the, the knowledge that they have. Uh, the CIA does use Americans in intelligence operations, but that is pretty much always exclusively done with that person having actually volunteered to participate. So a great example would be like a business, like someone who is a senior, you know, at a high level of, and I'm making this up, yeah. of an international oil and gas firm that's based in the United States that does business in, you know, the Persian Gulf, they might return from having met individuals in that area and actually agree to be debriefed, you know, by CIA. But the kind of broad, you know, the concept of the CIA working to collect information on Americans or to influence um American sort of public opinion, thought, elections, whatever it might be, you know, is just is just simply not true. Like anytime we're trying to put together a covert influence campaign to sway the hearts and minds of, of foreign citizens, right? There's a tremendous amount of, of uh, obstacles to putting that kind of thing together from a legal standpoint, because you have to demonstrate that whatever you're doing isn't going to get back into the, the sort of media atmosphere in the United States, as you can imagine, is, 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 you know, really, really challenging to do. So I just, I, I'm going to shut up there. But I think the, the idea that the agency is spying on you, um, you know, is, is pretty much patently false and, and is, is highly illegal in, in pretty much all its forms here in the United States. Well, you don't need to shut up. I have more questions. We're going to dig even deeper. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, you no, know, it's funny because you mentioned, you know, the first part, but because what was it called before the CIA? It was like the OSS or something like that. Or like uh, the OSS. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so wartime espionage outfit. Yeah, yeah. I remember Greg Hurwitz mentioning that because he's like, whenever they were trying to recruit for that, it's like, hey, we need someone with a PhD that can win a bar fight. And so that was kind of like what it was there at the beginning. <laughs> yeah. And then, you know, the the bar fighters and the PhDers kind of started to split off there at some point. But there, <laughs> there, there have to be because I, I do know some people personally that were kind of in this field. There are kind of black ops groups. There are kind of books that are or groups that are, uh, you know, somewhat off the books, I guess you could say, to do those clandestine operations, typically in other countries. Um, again, it, it's kind of a hard question, David, because it's like there's what you were exposed to. There's what there's what's hearsay. Then there's what's depicted in popular culture. And it's everybody thinks sure. Jason Bourne. Right. So Jason Bourne had to shoot this right. nameless, faceless person. And then he was in the program. And then you have something like Orphan X right from Greg Hurwitz. And it's like that type of thing. We just, it's like, we want that to be true because it seems yes, awesome. Yeah. Except for the fact that that's a movie guys. Like that's exciting. Do we really want people shooting random strangers to become a part of a, of an off the books, black ops uh, type of program within the government? I don't know that you actually want that, but talk to me a little bit about that, about the fact that it's kind of like, it's the ugly truth that we need people doing nasty things around the globe to protect us here on the homeland. Or is that just, you know, a bumper sticker slogan that I bought into? No, I think, you know, look, I, for for my description of the CIA as clandestine journalism, which is the bread and butter work of the CIA is, you know, stealing secrets from foreign governments and entities and then, you know, basically producing a classified you know, newspaper that goes to the president and other people around them that that enables them to make the best possible decisions. Like that is the the primary function of the CIA. However, 
the CIA has, and the most common piece of this is it, it used to be called the Special Activities Division. It's now called the Special Activities Center. It sits inside, um, at least I think, you know, as of the, the last time I saw an org chart, it sits inside the Directorate of Operations. That group has, you know, ground branch, air branch, maritime branch. These are, you know, officers who are typically kind of pulled from the military, you know, tier one groups, like to essentially um, conduct covert, I mean, to, to implement, I guess, what would typically be, so, you know, an element of a covert action finding that would require the use of something resembling military force, but that is being done under the auspices of the Central Intelligence Agency, right? Because we want the ability as a government to deny uh, that we did such a thing or to mask our role in that operation, right? Um, the CIA does that, right? I mean, and that was a, that was a big part of our work uh, throughout the war on terror in war zones, like in Iraq and Afghanistan, throughout the broader, you know, sort of Middle East, like that is definitely a piece of what the CIA does, but that kind of covert action sliver, which tends to get a lot of attention, right? Because it is, it, it is fundamentally interesting. I mean, it's why it's the subject of all these, you know, novels and films. Um, it's not, you know, you think about the market share of sort of, you know, the espionage business, um, it's it's a it's a smaller sliver of the work. Okay, let's talk about something before we move on to kind of how you transitioned out of that type of work. Obviously, there's a lot being made about what's going on at the southern border here in the United States. Uh, for all intents and purposes, it's porous. Uh, we literally have thousands of people streaming across the southern border every single day. And now people that don't pay any attention, they just assume it's Mexican nationals that are coming across the border, which there certainly is that. But there are people coming from all over Central America, all over South America. And then as my senator here in the state of Oklahoma, James Lankford, pointed out to Congress last year, in a calendar year, we encountered at the border, just the people that we encountered, that we knew came across the border from every single country in the world, including ones that are, you know, spoken enemies of us. That would be Iran or Syria or Eritrea or North Korea or China or Russia or any of these types of places. We encountered these people at the southern border. Now, here recently, I forget the guy's name, but there was a known terrorist who actually went to prison somewhere in the world for terrorist operations for like a decade. And there was video of him on the Texas side of the Southern border. And people are asking him like, Hey, who are you? And he's like, you're all going to know who I am soon. And so as an American, as an American with a wife and children and, you know, willing to fight and die and kill for, to, to protect them and the people that I love, there's this worry about people coming across the southern border and us as Americans having no freaking idea who they are and what they want to do while they're here. And then you hear these grumblings about uh, Islamist fun fundamentalist terrorists coming over here and they come over here individually, but then there are parts of what are called sleeper cells. So these are groups of people that are here in this country for the most part illegally that want to do damage to American people, American infrastructure, the, the government, just the overall peace of the country. So, from your experience within the CIA or this may be the FBI as well, or who the heck knows what other organizations, how can we rest easy knowing that, Hey, the federal government knows these people are here. We're watching them. We got eyes on them, right? Like we, we know what they're doing. Like I think about the, the, the TV show Homeland, one, one of the best TV shows maybe ever made, but like there were different sleeper cell options to where it's like, look, these, these groups weren't completely unknown to the federal government. Right. They were just being watched before they tried to carry out whatever attack they're doing. So there's a question in there somewhere, David, you're smart enough to find it. So ready, set, go. <laughs> well, look, let me, uh, so it was just, let me, let me say, make a couple of statements. I think both of these things are, both these things are, are, are true, right? It is, it is true that we can and should be doing far more to actually make that border less porous, right? You can't, sure. you can't make it impermeable, but you can do a heck of a lot more than we're doing now. And we are a country with borders, with sovereignty, like this should not be tangled up in our political dysfunction to make it harder to come across illegally, full stop. Mm. We should be doing more, we can be doing more, right? Um, it is also true that having a very porous border makes it easier for people who wish to do us harm 
to get into this country, although they are an infinitesimally small number of the people who would venture across, the damage that they could potentially do is significant. Right. And we should be doing a far better job of preventing it, you know, making it harder to come in illegally. The third point I would make is just that I think from a um, the standpoint of thinking about the risk that terrorism poses to us, you know, it, 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 it's it's terrorism is it's a very interesting psychological thing because you are far more likely to die on a motorcycle. You are far more likely to die in a car accident. You are, I think, far more likely to die like in your own bathtub than you are to be the subject or the victim of any kind of terrorist violence, particularly inside the United States. So I think that's just, you know, to just encourage everyone listening to this to kind of let's frame this appropriately. Like this isn't, there are plenty of instances of people coming into this country who wish to do us harm. They tend to get a tremendously outsized viewing in the media because it is like terrifying. Right. Yeah. It's, and and because it's sensational. The, one of them, it's sense it's sensational. Like the 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 greatest impact of these kind of attacks tends to be in the reaction to them. Not even just in the it's a tragedy, of course, when it happens, but not even just to the the body count of of what occurs mm -hmm. in the in the attack. Um, but you know th there are enough examples of these things where you say like, yeah, it is just returning to that second point. Like this is this is a, a risk. You know, I mean. The, the Iranians have attempted to use drug cartels to bring people into the country to to conduct hits, you know, on on like Saudis here. So right. this is this is this isn't a um, figment of the imagination or a fear, you know, a sort of theoretical uh, concept. Like these, the, you know, it, it it makes sense if you are an adversary who wishes us uh, harm or wishes to conduct operations here that. Having having a border that's crossable <laughs> yeah. with relative ease makes makes those operations easier. Yeah, I certainly uh, believe that. And, you know, I even heard a briefing here recently saying that, you know, a lot of people in Congress are being briefed about an imminent threat to the homeland. And one of my more macabre predictions for 2024 is, you know, obviously it's going to be crazy with the election. But I was like, unfortunately, I think that there will yeah. be a major terrorist attack on American soil. And so you can't ever actually predict these things like we don't know if it's going to be a 9-11 style or, or, or what type of thing. But it's like it wouldn't be a crazy thing at this point um, to, to assume something like that will happen. But for you, David, at some point you decided, hey, I don't want to be Jason Bourne anymore. I don't want to be going around the country killing uh, all these people and, you know, leaving a, leaving a trail of bodies and nothing else. You decided you didn't want to be that guy anymore. <laughs> So got it got tiring. Yeah, you it's know? just like it it's too tiring. much. It's just like too it's too, too many much. weapons, too much fun. So you decide that you want to transition out. So how did you come to that decision, and what did you move towards? Yeah, so I am. Um, I've gotten to a point where I I wanted, you know, I I had been doing. I've been working at the agency really my my sort of entire real professional life after the you know hole digging summer at that at that point and I thought I would like to see something else. I had gotten to a point where I was kind of on this cusp of like feeling as though if I keep going I'm going to be here forever. And I just felt something inside me of like I got to see what else is out there and uh my wife and I also sort of corresponded with us really wanting to get out of the DC area mm. and frankly go somewhere that's more normal. <laughs> and we threw now, you know, your listeners can debate whether Dallas, Texas meets those criteria. I would argue that it is uh, more normal than the Washington DC. It's kind of, it's kind of like Texas. It's sort of Texas. <laughs> it's, it's sort of, it's sort of Texas. Yes. Yeah. And, and we're doing a very poor job convincing anyone here that we're Texans to begin with, but <laughs> I, we, you know, so those two things kind of smashed together and I thought, you know, let's just, let's, let's go try something else. So I, I left and we moved to Dallas. I took a job, you know, uh, God help me and don't hold it against me, uh, working for a consulting firm, uh, here in, here in Dallas and did that for a number of years and sort of as I was considering, well, I'll rewind. Actually, there were th there was a three month period in between leaving the CIA and joining this consulting firm. 
where I sat down and just kind of started to write. And it was very unstructured. It was like, I'm just kind of writing my experiences of working on and living in Syria, which is primarily what I did when I was at the agency. Kind of working, I mean, you know, that the civil war that was going on there was, was had shattered the place. And I was really kind of just working through what I had worked on and seen and lived through. And then I started this job, right? And I kind of put all that stuff aside uh, and just became a became a consultant for a number of years, which was both good and bad. And then had the opportunity about five years ago to dust off those pages and to get back to the writing. And so that just kind of started this process of, you know, writing, writing these books, uh, which is what I do now. And so what kind of consulting were you doing? So I was a, uh, what's called a management consultant, okay. which, yeah. you know, in the kind of, uh, I mean, the, 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 the dark view is, is just doing layoffs and stuff, which is actually very little of, of what I did. Mostly it was trying to working with clients who are basically like, Hey, I have a, I have a particular business problem. Like I'm thinking about launching this new product or I want to move into this market, like helping them think about that decision and, um, putting facts the behind, you know, behind that decision so that they can make the best possible ones. So it's actually very similar in many respects to what I was doing at the CIA just for business. Okay. So as you mentioned, you're, you're now a writer full time, but at some point with something like that, that's not a traditional job. It's not your normal nine to five, you know, wear your suit and don't make any trouble type of job. At some point you have to burn the ships. You have to say, this is what yes. I do now. I am a writer. And for most people that have a career in writing, they're not given a whole bunch of money up front to ensure that they stick with it. You know what I mean? At some point there's a burn the ships risk. So can you take us through what that was like? Yeah. So it felt that way. You know, I, I talked about him, you burning the ships, jumping off the dock, like whatever uh, analogy you want to use, but you know, it, it, it's how it felt to me. So I, I had written the first book to station and it was, four, five months from coming out. And I was starting to tinker around with a second one. And I was doing the consulting work too. And seeing these two things in collision with one another for the first time of like, if I want to do this, if I want to write another book, if I want to go out and promote my writing so that it could, I can sell more books and keep the thing going, I can't do this 70, 80 hour a week consulting job. Like mm -hmm. they, they hit this point where they became mutually exclusive to one another. And I felt like, I felt like when I sat down, talked about it with my wife, prayed about it. Like it was, if I didn't move forward with the writing, I was going to look back in five or 10 years with just deep, deep regret <laughs> mm. that, that I hadn't pursued it. Cause at that point, you know, there's sort of, there's a first book coming out. It feels like, Hey, there's a wave I'm catching here. And if I just sort of don't get on that and ride that wave, I don't, is it going to come again? I, I don't know. Yeah. I feel like, and I just sort of felt called pushed, you know, to do it. And, uh, and I felt like, you know, if I leave this job and, and the writing stuff just crashes and burns, like I can, I could, I can come back. Maybe I could go find something else to do, but this writing wave felt pretty unique. And so it, but it did, it was, you know, it's scary. I mean, you're going from a job where, you know, there's, there's pretty good pay and like, you know, <laughs> health insurance and all this kind of stuff. And like going into this, world of writing, which, which also is sort of bizarre because your day to day is kind of unstructured, right? I'm, you might feel as to have like, you know, it's, it's not like all of a sudden there's five or six hours of like phone calls and zooms and like structure to it. It's like the whole calendar is blank. It's kind of like what you make of it. Like, do you get your words done that day? Right. It's not someone else. It's not someone else's fault. If you don't get them done, like you've got to get them done. Like, how do you set up the whole architecture for your business? Like, no one's, no one's pushing you to do that stuff. Like you got to do it, you know? Right. So that stuff's been really fun, but it's also, you know, 
terrifying too. Well, it's, it's an eat what you kill environment. And I mean, my first job out of college was a hundred percent commission job. And so I've just kind of been living in that. And because people love the idea of freedom, the idea of waking up and doing yeah. whatever the way they want to do the, the idea of, Oh, my kid doesn't feel well today. I don't need to move my entire life uh, and ask somebody's permission to take care of my kid or ask someone's permission to go and do this thing. But the level of responsibility that you have just goes through the roof. It goes absolutely through the roof yeah. because you, you can't basically stop uh, stop the train once you get on it. And again, if if you don't work that day, you don't make money. And so um, so let's let's talk about you and let's talk about uh, the, the, the writing process, because whenever you do a book like Damascus Station or the new book, Moscow X, th there seems to be a lot of research that has to go into it while you're writing now I, I know at least somewhat about some people's process there are people that are basically uh i guess they're writing processors so as they're writing they are processing what needs to happen to the character or to the scene or to the the mm -hmm. narrative and then that's the direction their research goes then you have other people that do just months and months and months of research before they put the first word of you know the prologue down um so what, what's kind of your process or i guess what was your process with damascus station was it hey i've already kind of written this stuff and now i just need to make characters that are you know vaguely interesting or what does that look like so i'm a um i'm a kind of in that former camp right of people who need to figure out the story as they write it. So okay. I don't, and I've experimented with outlines, but I've not found them to be useful for me. And I don't, I don't use them. And I eventually abandoned, I put together an outline for Damascus station, abandoned it. I put together an outline for Moscow X, abandoned it huh. like within days of what? starting to write. So I'm like, I'm like, why am I doing this? This is, you know, this is a complete waste of my time. I just need to get into it. And I have felt, um, you know, it's, it's interesting. I, the way I'm wired, there's a tend, I, I'll have a tendency to think about like, okay, maybe it'd be better if I sit down at 830 instead of actually having to get into the scene and write it. Maybe I'll, I'll try to read a book or read a set of articles that help me do research for the scene. Or maybe I'll want to go talk to somebody who knows something about like, I wrote a scene a couple days ago for a book that involves safe cracking. And I've got a, a contact who's a safe cracker and I'm like, well, maybe I should call him to kind of talk through the mechanics of how this, how this would work in, in reality to get through this type of lock. Um, that kind of stuff, it's all necessary, but for me, I actually find there's a little voice in my head as I'm thinking about doing any of that stuff. That's like, you're putting off the words, like you're putting off the hard work of actually sitting down with a blank page mm. and coming up with or manufacturing or or being open to the story presenting itself, depending on how you sort of see things. And so what I've tended to try to do is for the first draft, very little research, um, only what's absolutely necessary. And I just try to write every day between two and 3000 words, get the thing down on paper. And then I sort of look at that when it's all done. And that first draft is typically 150, 160,000 words, way longer than an actual book. And it's, it, it really, and it's hard to overstate this. It sucks. Like <laughs> it really is bad, but that is the, it's not even a story. It's like the, you know, it's like all the different, if you were cooking a meal, it's not even like me cooking a bad meal. It's like me putting all the ingredients out on the counter and being like, okay, what am I going to do? What are we really going to make tonight? And that is an emotionally exhausting part of the process, at least for me, because you're from whole cloth finding characters and storylines and trying to figure out how you, you know, sort of the, the emotional spine of the book. But then once you have that, then it's like, all right, I've got to go and have the conversation with the safe cracker because I don't want to write a scene where, you know, it, like like I, where I sprinkle pixie dust over it to show how they get into the safe. Like there's an actual reality to safe cracking. So then I go and have the conversation with, with Charlie and, or, you know, I read over here on my shelf, like, you know, I read my next book is focused on Israel, Iran, like I'll, I'll you know, read 10 books on Iran. Right. So there's, there's a process, but I try to put that off 
to actually, you know, as long as I can to get the story down on paper first. And that's a very intuitive process. I don't, I don't outline it. I just write what feels like it needs to come out. I really appreciate how you put that because you, you basically took any semblance of sexy out of that process. Cause like one of my good buddies, Joby <laughs> Martin, he says his dad gave him the wisdom. Like at one point in his life, he said, look, you don't wake up and go to fun. You go to work. And so if you have one of these sexier jobs, like you do actually have to do the work because a lot of guys in my audience are Jack Carr fans. And so they see Jack Carr on Instagram. They see all the cool stuff he does. They, oh, he's going on Joe Rogan. It's like, you guys realize he had to sit down every single day for months on end and put pen to paper to create that narrative that you just listen to in 12 hours at two times speed to, right. to get this entire narrative. Like that came from somewhere. It's the same thing. Like when I see people, they will binge watch season one of a television show that just came out two days ago. And then they're like, Oh, well, well, when's season two coming out? It's like you jack wagon. It took like a thousand people three years to get you that 10 hours worth of entertainment. Can yeah. you chill out for a little bit? But I guess my next question, David, would be at what point, and I guess this could get into misperceptions of the, of the publishing world, so maybe combine these two. At what point do you let the writing go? So you've written it, mm. you've rewritten it, you've edited it, you've connected a point from chapter three with a point from chapter 14, and you just feel like, I'm done. I'm going to send this off. And, and frankly, people don't even understand the publishing world. They don't understand what that looks like. They think you write the world's perfect novel. You give it to an editor who corrects comma splices and verb tensing. And then, you know, they, it just comes out a few months later. So kind of move all that together to give us an idea what that looks like for you. So I'll give you the, the, the bottom line up front is that for me, that is somewhere around 10 drafts, typically. And what that looks like is the first draft, big honking thing, plot holes you could drive a train through, <laughs> terrible prose, you know, weird, like, you know, the, the chronology of it doesn't make sense, but there's bits and pieces that really work and the beginnings of the kind of story. So that's like draft one. And I typically try to get there from the moment I start it, I try to get there within four to six months. Okay. And then you put that down for a little bit. Can you I can show... actually pause you real quick? I, I got to ask this before yeah. I forget, because I know you're smart enough to pick right back up. So you mentioned plot holes. Okay. So I feel like a moron when I go to IMDb. And I look up, you know, the stuff, because if you go to IMDb, Inter Internet Movie Database, and you plug in your favorite movie, and then there are, there's like a section that says like problems or mistakes or something like that. And so it could be like, <laughs> you know, a period piece that's set a thousand years ago, and yet there's a Starbucks cup that's like in one on scene on accident kind of a thing. Yeah. But there's a section where it talks about all the plot holes. And I don't know if I'm, if I'm just too dumb to be breathing, but there will be these massive plot holes in sh in shows or movies and i didn't even notice until i read yeah. somebody just pointed out and then it's like oh my gosh of course like we've all had movies where we're like that didn't make sense or i didn't really like the ending but for you as you're writing david how do you know that this is a plot hole how do you know that this doesn't go anywhere how do you know that this isn't a satisfactory way for this character or mm. this thing to move yeah that's a good question um and I guess it makes me think that the word plot hole is a little bit um, too precise because the the holes could be matters of care. I mean, so character and plot are just like plot is character in motion, right? It's all character, but like you could have a characterization issue, uh, and 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 I absolutely do with because of the way I write, where like I'm writing and as I go, I'm finding the character. Okay. And so the stuff that I've written toward the end tends to be closer to that character's true voice than the stuff I've written at the beginning. And so if I've got chapter three written from the viewpoint of, you know, Billy Bob, and then I get to chapter 65 and I'm writing another Billy Bob chapter, I, you know, I have spent literally, you know, six months sitting in front of a computer getting to know Billy Bob over the course of writing the book. Mm. And so I got to go back to chapter three in my editing and be like, would he say this? Is this actually what he's like? Is yeah. this his interior thoughts? Mm. Like, 
so there, there's there's holes of characterization that appear naturally over the writing process. There's also holes of characterization that can appear if you're trying to force a character to do something that actually doesn't make sense for them okay. for the purposes of plot or story. And oftentimes I will skip over those over the course of that first draft because I, I just want to get to the end as fast as possible so mm. I can begin the work of kind of refining. But I know it's there and I have to go back and sort of wrestle with it uh, later on. And then there are holes of plot where it's like, you know, um, okay, how... Well, here's what I was working with just a few days ago. How does I, I needed I needed the Iranian intelligence services to get access to a list of Mossad officers? Okay, how does that happen? Well, up until yesterday, I didn't have that problem solved, and it was just this like massive plot hole. So you'd be you could be what you know in if you'd been reading the book, you'd get to this point and you're like, what? Like where <laughs> where did this come from? That's never explained. Um, and all the way on down to little things, which actually in Damascus Station, my first book, there was an uh, an editing snafu. And so the type of car someone's driving changes between like pages six and seven, right? So it's like, uh, oh, wait. Yeah. And that, wait a that's, a mi- that's, a minor, that's a minor thing, but readers always love to kind of do the like, ah, gotcha. Yeah, nailed so it. Mr. Author, like you, you screwed up. Um, so there's there's all manner of in- inconsistencies uh, that, that appear. And over the course of, it's like solving a Rubik's cube that's like working against you at the same time, right? Because you you start to solve bigger problems, and as you kind of like turn the wheel, or you think about it as like tying something, like you know, another like problem pops out somewhere that you then have to have to go and solve. So you really do have to kind of be an artist and an engineer, like an engineer to make sure that this world behaves as it should and that there aren't insane things that happen uh, inside the minds of characters or very technically. And then an artist in order to actually get the emotional resonance of the book right and the characterization right. Well, yeah, I think artist and engineer is the perfect way to say it because I even do that here on my show. So when I'm doing a solo episode, let's say I'm talking about a very complicated topic. So recently I did uh, something on the Enneagram. I went way down the rabbit Mm. hole in that personality test and went all the way back to like core level stuff. And I was like, okay, so as I'm creating it, I'm creating it as thoughts are popping up. I've got my thoughts that I've kind of jotted down along the way, but then like I'm going back and forth and I'm editing the first part and it's all about cogency. It's all about narrative. It's like, okay, if somebody listens to this straight through, there needs to be a narrative that carries them. And frankly, I do the same thing when it comes to preparing interviews. And so I prepare an interview as if the person is only going to answer the questions that I ask them and I'm not interested in any follow-up. And because if that happens, then I can guarantee that there is a narrative arc to the conversation that ends with, hey, I really like that guy. I'm going to go buy his book or, hey, that's really interesting. I'm going to go study this topic a little bit further. But also that's the engineer part. Right. But there's also the artist part, which the first interview I did with Greg was, you know, last year, uh, which is really goes to this. I, I prepared like I prepare normally, and then I go back and look at the questions I prepared, and I didn't ask a quarter of them because the conversation just mm. weaved into a more philosophical world. And I was like, "F it, let's go! Like let let's let's burn, yeah. burn what I was going to do." And so you have to kind of keep that tension of artist and engineer. But I blew up you kind of explaining like the publishing process, what it looks like for your yeah. editing, and then maybe misperceptions about what what happens during the editing process or just the process of getting the book in the hands of the reader. Well, I mean, honestly, let me take the misperceptions part first. You talked about this with with uh, Jack Carr and you know his writing, and you kind of see. I think we as a society, and it might just be in general humans, kind of there's sort of this mystique or lionization of writers, right, and writing, and it is seen as this highly like, uh, I don't know, maybe it's even a, kind of a sexy job to have, yeah. right? And the the re- <laughs> the reality of it is that. In some ways, it is much more satisfying to have written than to be writing (laughs) because you, you know, like having written, we can have this fun conversation about my life, the books, like I got, you know, there's a book behind me here that I've written that I'm immensely proud of. That's really fun. This book behind me, Moscow X, like it absolutely sucked (laughs) to write this thing. It was miserable. Yeah. My the first the first draft I completed of it, 
my wife, who's my first reader, read it, had made comments, showed up at the coffee shop where I was writing, sat down and was like, this isn't very good. Oh, no. And you need to make some big changes. No. And so you're like, that is a terrible feeling. Oh, yeah. It's a terrible feeling as any of us, you know, who who do any kind of work, right? And not necessarily writing, but anything. The When you open up the equivalent of a blank document, right? And And that could also be, you know, if you were doing something in the real world with your hands where you were having to start the really kind of thankless, gritty process of getting something actually done, right? It typically, like it, it is not, it is typically not fun to get started. Mm. In my experience, it's not fun to get started going. Like if you're out of shape and you have to get into a gym and start doing work, it is really not fun. Yeah. If you were trying to learn a new skill and you were in the beginner stages of it, like that typically sucks because you you kind of know that you suck and it's hard and your body and your mind don't want to work together to get it done. And the blank page in writing is very much like that. It's like behind all of the, the writing or like the finished book is like me sitting, you know, in my pajamas at a coffee shop, staring off into space, wondering what should be written down on this piece of paper. And that is like, that's the work. But if, and if you don't, if you don't do that work, if you wait around for inspiration or you wait around to go and like clean out the garage or you wait around to, you know, take the jujitsu classes or you, you know, you wait around to go to the gym, like, it just doesn't, it's just not going to happen. Like my experience with most things in life has been that uh, success or victory isn't some, it's not taken in a gigantic leap. It's literally just small decisions over and over and over again that get you to this big thing being done or that get you into like that point in your life that point in your marriage, that point in your relationship with your kids, like whatever it could be. It's like, it's all of these very small things that kind of build up to that. And I think writing is very similar where it's like, honestly, success every day is just putting words down on the paper. And then eventually you look up after doing that for six months and you're like, oh, there's a book here, you yeah. know? Well, we get to choose our discipline. But every day that's, every day that's hard, you know, yeah. you don't want to you're, something in you fights it. Well, and you're, ch you're choosing to wade into that discomfort because we do get to choose our level of discomfort. I, I was having a, a conversation with one of my best friends here recently that's thinking about getting into gi jiu-jitsu, like actually training on a regular basis. And he's kind of asking me questions like, what's it going to be like? And when do I feel like I can get better? I was like, well, I've been training mm -hmm. for seven years. And there are times when I leave class feeling like, God, I'm dangerous. Like, man, but better, nobody better mess with me on my way from the door to the, to my truck, because I'm just going to smash them. And then I also have these classes where I'm like, have I ever trained jujitsu before? Because I just rolled with a bunch of gorillas. <laughs> yeah. Like there are times when you look around and you know, you're looking for the, the nails because you think you're the hammer and all you see are other hammers. And it's just like, Oh, this is going to hurt for the next hour or so. But it's like, look, yeah, I trained for seven years before I got to the point where it's like, yeah, I can, I can handle myself against just about anybody. Um, and if I go against someone that's significantly better, I can at least do things to frustrate them on their, on their, you know, journey to killing me. But then also, um, <laughs> you know, people think about, yeah, you know, being a writer must be fun. Being a podcaster must be fun. But the funny thing about it is when people ask me, Kyle, like I'm thinking about starting a podcast, what advice would you give me? My advice is always don't do it. Don't, don't start a podcast. I was like, if you can't stare at a screen, a blank screen once a week for three years, and turn that blank screen into 60 minutes worth of content that people actually want to listen to. And it's three mm. years before you have more than 15 listeners that aren't your family members and friends. It's like, then don't do it. It's way too hard. Like the payoff is not going to be worth it. And so I don't know if that's just my pessimism coming out, but I'm sure you have a lot of people reach out to you because you know, you're a successful published author, but what do you tell people that are like, Hey David, I want to be like you. I want to be like Jack Carr. I want to be like Greg Hurwitz. I want to be like Steven Pressfield. I want to be like Brad Thor. Just tell me how to do it. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, I mean, what you're saying about the podcasting resonates with me because what I'm getting from you from this conversation I and mean, from our conversation, you know, at dinner uh, last year is like, you like 
what you're doing right now. Like the inputs to it mm. is something that, while it while it um, frequently is frustrating, hard, you have to, there's probably a lot of times where you're like, I've got to force myself to do this work, right? There's, there's enough um, flow that can get generated from just the act of doing the thing that we're doing right now that my guess is that that you're like i like this and so you're just sort of doing this and then you know you you create the success that kind of gets created around you is a byproduct of your desire to just do the thing as opposed to the reason you're doing this thing to begin with and i think that the what i typically tell people with respect to writing is like you have to if you are if you are getting into this because you want to have written that is going to not work because you are going to eventually have one you might get 30,000 words down and then you're going to run into 2 weeks of crappy writing and you're going to get frustrated and stop but if you are doing this because the act of sitting down in front of a screen, put aside publishing, put aside books being out there, put aside talking about the books. If you're sitting down because you like to create and find stories and put them down in words and enough of the time you show up, you can eventually for some piece of that day, get into a flow where time disappears then you're good because the source of energy that you're going for and that's powering everything is actually the input to the whole process to begin with, which is putting words down, getting words down on paper. You have to like, if that doesn't energize you at some point in time for some piece of the process, then, then don't, don't bother because it's just going to end poorly for you and, and all of your, all of your loved ones. Yeah. But, um, I think that, and I think that's, I don't know, man, I think that that's true with a lot of stuff in life of like the, the smaller, I don't know if I'm, I'm articulating it effectively, but like the, if, if you can get yourself to a point where like the, you are comfortable with the level of pain required by the thing itself, trading jujitsu, as opposed to having won jujitsu competitions, right? Like you can get writing the books as opposed to having written books, like you can get yourself comfortable with the pain of the inputs and, and, and also on the other side, like the sort of the joy and the high of the inputs, like yeah. you're walking out of the gym and you're like amped because you just, you know, that, that hour passed like that. Cause you were just in the zone. You can get yourself comfortable with that sort of give and take. Um, you've probably found something that, you know, you'll eventually in all likelihood end up being successful at and probably making a decent living from because you're aligning you know, your energy, your passion with stuff that other people value too. And that's, that's beautiful. I think that's a very good word. Cause I tell people all the time, like there are people that are passionate about something, but they suck at it. So look at the first week mm -hmm. of any American idol season, right? So it's these people that are very <laughs> passionate about yeah. singing, but they suck at it. But then you have people that are passionate about something. Uh, they're actually good at it, but the marketplace doesn't need it. Right. And so there are, there always has to be this kind of overlap of the market needs this. Plus you're good at it. You know, plus you like doing it because there are people that have, uh, you know, podcasts that just shouldn't, uh, they shouldn't be talking. They, they've added, they add nothing to the conversation. They add nothing to the marketplace, but it's because they want the sexy outcome, right? They want to have written, they want to have created, they want to be the person yeah. up in front of everybody talking and everybody like hanging on every word, but they forget that there has to be something on the front end of that. And that's just, that's just too much for a lot of people to overcome. But let's, let's specifically talk uh, about the new book now. So the new book is called Moscow X. So uh, it was just, you know, uh, you gave me the, the uh the audio version of it because i explained to you how hard it is for me to read fiction because my brain doesn't fire all the time and I, it's hard for me to keep everybody straight but whereas damascus station was obviously set in you know kind of syria and that whole area this is more moscow russia right so that's kind of the the main place yeah. where this takes place so i guess for you where did you get the idea for moscow x and this does seem like a hard left turn from the stuff that you were doing mm. in the middle east right so i guess where did your interest in trying to set something in russia come from well <laughs> so man this was uh kind of a crazy uh story so 
I started this book, Moscow X, with the first draft ish of it was uh, set entirely in Texas. And uh, I had I had come up with this idea, which at the time seemed interesting and cool, and I now realize was insane uh, to set a spy novel entirely in Texas. It was going to be a chase between Dallas and Big Bend, Big Bend area. And um, there were Russians in that book, but it was like all here. And I, I had like Russian defectors in Plano and I had uh, a Russian assassins, like this hit team operating under the cover of like a Terminex van. And I had gone down to Big Ben and camped, done a whole bunch of research down there to kind of get the vibes right. Which that was, that's a beautiful part of the country, mm. by the way. I'd highly recommend that anyone spend time down there. It's, it's incredible. But uh, I, I wrote this thing and I kind of had this like nagging feeling as I was writing it, which I, is now a feeling I've come to recognize, I think, quicker in my writing process of like something's wrong. There's just, there were like these alarms going off as I was writing this thing that this wasn't the right story. And I just kept pushing through, pushing through, pushing through. And I wrote, 60, 70,000 words, something like that. So like a decent chunk of it, send it off to my editor. Uh, he, he calls me back a couple weeks later and he's like, this sucks. Oh no. And, and you shouldn't write this book. <clears throat> and here's why. And he kind of gives some reasons and he's of course right on all of this stuff. So I'm sitting there and this is like a dark, this is sort of a dark period, right? Because I've just spent all this time and energy getting this thing going. And, and he's basically saying like, this isn't a let's modify this things by 20% here. This is yeah. erase it and then start again. Yikes. And I, uh, I listened to him, but I took a couple Russian characters from that book and cause I thought they worked and I put them in Moscow and St. Petersburg and just started to play around with some new ideas. And then I quickly realized that now I have got to like, learn a whole bunch of stuff about Russia because I'm going to have to set the book there. And honestly, I'm glad that I didn't fully think through the ramifications of that decision because it was a ton of work. And it's why the book was so one of the reasons why it was so hard to write. I mean, there were other reasons, you know, the invasion happened like halfway through writing the thing, which mm. was a big problem. Um, but I, I uh, it was honestly that simple. It was like, I've got these characters I like, and then I think can carry a story. They're Russian. I need to move them to Russia. And then all of a sudden I'm, I'm just off running. Um, I don't, I don't typically think about anything commercial as I'm writing really. And I don't think about the reader while I'm writing. So for me, this was like, I like these characters. I want to explore this. I did not think it might be a bad idea for me to, you know, set this whole thing in Russia because it's going to be a whole bunch of work. I just kind of push through with the characters and then, um, because I felt like they were speaking to me and there was a story there. So I, I rolled with it and, you know, a Russia focused book is what came out of it. It's interesting. You said you don't think about the reader <clears throat> because people are shocked sometimes whenever I talk about the, the show and I say, well, yeah, I'm, I, I am thinking about the, the final audience, but I'm working for an audience of one. And so I'm like, whenever I had tens of listeners, it's like, I'm, yes. I'm working as unto the Lord and I'm going to create something that I can be proud of that I could say before God someday and say, yeah, that podcast that I did, I, I put my full effort into it because I acted like you were my boss. And so it's, it's different whenever you have different ideas as to kind of who you're going to now with, with this book. So people that pick up Moscow X, it'll be in the show notes, guys, you should definitely check it out. So this isn't like a, a fast paced thriller, like what you would expect mm -hmm. from, you know, guys that we had talked about, Greg Hurwitz with the Orphan X series or the Jack Carr novels with James Reese, his character. It's a novel that focuses more on, uh, I guess you could say the cerebral and not the kinetic aspects of espionage. At least that's how I would, would say it. And so, yeah, I think that's um, right. okay. So, so, I guess give a pitch to my audience because there's, you know, there's something about just turning your brain off and watching uh, The Expendables, right? Because those movies are ridiculous. All the First Blood movies are absolutely ridiculous, except for the first one. But it's just like there's something to be said about that. 
And then there's something to be said for one of my favorite movies of all time, Zero Dark Thirty, because it's a three hour long movie that I went to the movie theater thinking it was going to be, you know, two hours and 45 minutes about the raid on, you know, where Bin Laden was hiding. And it ended up being two hours and 45 minutes of setup for 10 minutes of the raid. And I loved it. I thought it was great, but it was way more cerebral than it was kinetic. So why approach it that way? Why not just do the low hanging fruit of guns blazing and, you know, chicks being saved from, you know, certain death? Well, so I'll tell you, um, I, uh, I've, I've typically tried to write stories that have some grounding in kind of the real world of the espionage business and, and the kind of bread and butter espionage business that I was talking about earlier in this conversation, which is not stuff blowing up. It's more this kind of dance around recruiting people who have information we want and then doing stuff with that information. And it tends to be the case that that stuff is far less about things blowing up and far more about, frankly, kind of a psychological dance, which is some parts, you know, just friendship and some parts manipulation and you're dealing with different kind of, um, you know, angles on deception and identity and and it, it's it's much more about that right than it is about guns blazing now i will say that the arc of my my books and i've my my third one's coming out in october and it's done so the arc of this one is also the same it's like i i like and i think this is you know i'm talking about you know working for an audience of one right i write primarily for my nightstand Like that is what I'm thinking about as I'm writing. It's like, do I like this? Like, is this a book that I would be proud of that I would want to read that I would put that I, you know, if if I saw this book and I hadn't written it, would I go and check this thing out of the library, go buy it and put it on my nightstand to read, right? That is literally, for me, that is the goal. And so when I'm thinking about the, the story, I'm, I'm not thinking about like, well, is there enough action here to draw someone in? I'm honestly just thinking about if I'm interested in the story and the way that my stories have typically gone is like, I want to build, I want to build up um, the characters to a point where you as the reader really are interested in all of them care about some of them. And then it typically hockey sticks about two thirds of the way through generally where the stakes become so high, all of these different threads collide, and then stuff starts to go kind of crazy. So in some respects, like, I'm not comparing myself to him at all. But I think like, you know, Tarantino movies do this kind of good job of like, there's a lot of there's there's a lot of building, right? There's kind of building and then like, at some point, things just kind of go completely haywire. Yeah, I like stories like that, where I've, by the time they go haywire, I start to feel invested. You know, so so my books like they don't typically start with some a bunch of random people getting killed because I feel like as a as a when I'm reading those books, I'm like, yeah, oh, I don't really care about any of these people. So like the action could be good, but like, you know, it's not doing anything for me emotionally. Like I, I want, you know, my characters to be, you know, killing family members and doing all this kind of crazy stuff later in the book when you're like, oh my gosh, like it's it's much more uh, you know, impactful because you care about them as people. So I don't know. That's, you know, that's how I've tended to approach it. Every book's a little bit different, but that's just kind of my style. Well, and that's the character development piece that you get from these long running series, like television series. So it's like, you know, uh, you know, whatever you would be into. So if it's Breaking Bad, you're like really into what's going on with Walter White and he's an anti-hero that you're actually rooting for. And maybe it's Tony Soprano. And so you've, you know, sat there and you've invested all this time in this character. And then at the very end, when they kind of leave you hanging as to whether or not he was actually you know, killed or something like that, you know, you're super invested in it. But uh, David, I really appreciate all the the time we spent on all this. I'll make this the last question of the day because I'm just curious for you as a writer. So with Damascus Station or with Moscow X, you know, how much of the stuff that's in those books are at least, you know, tangentially related to the stuff that you actually did or saw when you were in the CIA Mm. versus how much of it is straight fiction? So like, what percentage of it is like, yeah, this is like real world stuff that actually happened versus, yeah, like this is just stuff that I thought would sound cool and, you know, would be good if it was on my nightstand. Well, I, I so I think, look, I, I have generally tried where I can to make, 
you know, whether whether it's an operation, whether it's a piece of trade craft, whether it's like a little fact about the CIA, tried to make that stuff true when and where I can, right? Um, so there's a lot of stuff in these books that that's real. A lot of the, almost all the trade craft is real. Um, almost all the tech is real. You know, um, the the way the sort of the, even down to kind of like the ethos, the culture of the CIA, like I've tried to make, I've tried to build that kind of fr framework or foundation of authenticity across the books, because I like, I like reading books where you feel like you're led into this world, right? You're led into a world that the author has engineered to be, to feel real and in many respects to be real. So like, I, I generally try to start from that standpoint. Now, what I will say is like, there are points where the story demands that you break those rules, the rules of, you know, reality or the real CIA. And uh, I try to be judicious about that. So like, I never want, because the last thing you want, I think we've all had this experience in movies or with books where you read something, it instantly pulls you out of the story because the author screwed up. They screwed up a basic fact right. or they right. did something with a character or a plot where you're like, that actually doesn't make any sense. And you're just kind of done. Like it's hard to go back to the story after that because you fundamentally have like the, the bubbles popped on that world. So I try to be really judicious about when I do that um, in the story. And I try, honestly, if I break rules, I try to actually explain that, I, that they're being broken so that and then ex sort of explain why so that the reader understands like, oh, okay, okay, you know, this case officer in Damascus station made this tremendous mistake. How is he coming back for another piece of the op two months later? Like in reality, you sort of you get sidelined or fired, but I kind of explain the way the process went enough and then throw you a little bit of a hook at the end to, sh to explain how he got involved where I think you as the reader might be more willing to go along with it. So it's this, it's it's a, it's a balance, but I always try to I try to keep it grounded as much as I can in reality. Okay, very good. Well, hey, we weaved in and out of a lot of different subject matters today. I'm really appreciative of your time, and like this feels like a continuation of our first conversation we we had last year over dinner. But as for now, that's all for me. Is there anything else you want to get off your chest? Well, I, you know, I will hopefully have some time now to actually follow through on the jujitsu, so we can. We can do another another check in here at some point in in the coming months or year, and hopefully I'll have a better answer for you. Okay, because um, I want I want to do it, and uh, my son's gotten into swimming this year, which has been like competitive swimming, which has been really good for him and awesome to just be out there using your body. But I think jujitsu would also be a wonderful a wonderful answer. So so this hopefully is, more to come. There. This is just what I'm going to do. The next time I see you, I'm not even going to ask. I'm just going to grab you. <laughs> I'm just going to grab you with both hands and I'm just going to see what you do because at this point, like if ever anyone knows about the five love languages, physical touch used to be pretty high for me, but now it's way low because if someone's touching me, <laughs> I'm assuming they're trying to kill me with my own clothing. And so it's like, you know, that's one of those things. I'm just going to grab you and just see what happens. Does that sound like a good plan? That sounds good. And, and instead of touching you next time, I will just bring you a gift, which might be another one of your love languages and more, safe hey, for everyone so cigars whiskey or jerky you're, you're pretty much a safe bet with any one of those so david mccloskey thank you for coming on a dawn to life of man's podcast thanks kyle this was a ton of fun there you go, guys. I hope you enjoyed my time with David McCloskey. But before we let you go, we are going to do a quick resilience boost. At Undaunted Life, our mission is equipping men to push back darkness with content that forges spiritual, mental, and physical resilience. And the links here in the show notes are where you can go and buy his books. You should definitely do so. Thank you guys so much for listening to this episode. Wherever you're listening to this, please subscribe, rate, and leave us a positive five-star review. If you want me to come speak live at your event or on your podcast, just shoot me an email to info at undaunted.life. That's I-N-F-O at undaunted.life. Follow us on Instagram and like us on Facebook and check out our website for everything else, including how to donate to keep more content like this coming your way. Just go to www.undaunted.life. And also, we want to thank the band Holy Name for allowing us to use their music for our content. The music on this podcast is their song, Perpetua, which is off their self-titled debut album on Face Down Records. The links are in the description. I'm your host, Kyle Thompson. Remember, keep pushing back darkness, keep forging spiritual, mental, and physical resilience, keep seeking the Lion of Judah. <laughs>